Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to uh, back to Acts chapter 17. Uh, we will be continuing in uh, our study through the book of Acts. Uh, in a couple more weeks in 17. Uh, as you're flipping there, uh, a couple of announcements. Next Sunday is our family night slash fall fest. And so... Uh, uh, I hope you're making plans to be there. So for, at 5 o'clock, we'll have our family meeting, which is our type of business meeting. And that'll go from 5 to 6. And from 6 to 8 uh, will be our fall fest. And so we're looking forward uh, to, to that. Uh, small groups, as always, are still going on. If you haven't joined one, it's not too late uh, to, to join one of those. There's information about those in the foyer. Uh, you can grab that or speak to one of us pastors. We can get you connected. Uh, as always, uh, it's good to, for all your guests that are here. God, thank you so much for being here. I hope that uh, uh, that you enjoy your time with us. Uh, if you will, do us a favor by uh, on the bottom of this uh, bulletin, there's the I'm New Here section. If you'll fill that out, uh, drop it in the giving box, or you can scan the QR code and do that digital, and we will reach out to you. Uh, really awesome. Uh, this morning, we also have... Uh, pastors and, and uh, church members that are out serving other uh, places. And so this morning, Luke is finishing up a camp for uh, Temple Baptist Church in Hattiesburg. They're at Walkaway. I think it's a senior high youth retreat that he's finishing up this morning. And then an awesome thing is that, so West Laurel currently doesn't have a pastor, and they've reached out to us about maybe some pulpit supply. And so we've uh, been together, put a pool of people that are just church members. And so this morning, Braxton Rayburn is preaching at West Laurel uh, this morning. So we're able to love on them and support them. So just thank God for what he's doing. And, uh, and so we'll have some others going in the future in the next couple weeks. And so anyway, be praying uh, for Braxton. Acts chapter 17, uh, let's pick up in verse 16. Uh, so we remember last week that uh, things were going good in Berea till they weren't. And Paul was uh, uh, rushed out or uh, kicked out of Berea or the brothers there snuck him out uh, and when we picked up, it said that he went all the way. They brought him as far as Athens, and then that's where he was waiting on Timothy and Silas to get there. That's what we read in verse 16, so let's start there. It says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him he saw, as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. And some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him and said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, and they uh, took him and brought him to Areopagus, saying, uh, we, may we know what it, this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athen Athenians uh, and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your love for us. Uh, God, we pray now as we look to your word, uh, that you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear. God, speak to us things we don't know. Teach us. Uh, and God, make us more like Jesus even today as we open up your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody said, hey amen. I want to bring up a map to you. Josh, do you have it with you today? You, Josh, you're failing me. Uh, let's bring up the map. And so what we saw last week, if you go all the way to the top left, uh, he was in Berea. And so now he, is, he has sailed to Athens is where we pick up today. And so uh, anyway, I'm not going into any geographical uh, geography with you like Luke would, but that's just where he is now. All right, everybody got it? Everybody says yes? All right. Uh, and so anyway, Athens, we all have heard of Athens, right? And so uh, even if you haven't read the Bible, you're familiar with Athens. And so really in this story, setting it up, I want to almost personif personify Athens, if you will, uh, about because obviously it's a place, it's a city, but that city had people and it had its own uh, culture, if you will, or multiple cultures. But anyway, we'll get to that in a little bit. And so Ultimately, I want to set the scene. First of all, he's in Athens. It's the foremost Greek city since the 5th century. Uh, it was incorporated into Rome, but it still retained its proud intellectual independence, and it was a free city. 
It was rich in philosophical tradition, inherited by people that came from Athens, named Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Its literature and its art and its accomplishments were unmatched. And even though at this point, when Paul is there, it's a shell of its former self that still lived in its great past. It was the intellectual uh, metropolis of the world. Aesthetically, it was magnificent. Everywhere you went, there was beautiful architecture. There were shrines and monuments and buildings that people just marveled at. They were sophisticated, philosophical, and what we see in this text, they were very, very religious. Then you have Paul, who probably wasn't happy where he was. He, first of all, he, we know that he was called, but he was called where? To Macedonia. And things didn't happen good in Macedonia. So now he finds himself alone, probably disappointed because everywhere he goes and things start happening, he has to leave there. Uh, and for some commentators, it maybe even at his lowest moment. Could you imagine Paul for a moment where he was? Everything's been good. Philippian, uh, we see the Philippian church uh, planted and things are great. He moves on to Thessalonica and then things are going good till they weren't. And then he moves down to Berea and things are going good till they weren't. And now he finds himself by himself in a place called Athens, uh, full of all of this idolatry. You could imagine maybe even the human side of him being disappointed and even saddened and desperate and alone. And what we see in Paul here is how, first of all, it's a side to the text, but how he reacts in his disappointment maybe. Or maybe how uh, he's probably all up in his, how we would say it, in his fields at this moment. He's not where he thought he should be or wants to be. He's by himself, and he's all up in his fields. And so here you have Paul coming to Athens in this setting. And first of all, I'm going to break the text. I'm really only going to get to verse 18. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I tried hard to break down more than that, but I'm going to finish three verses today. And the way that I want us to see, first of all, he's setting that context. Here's the landscape in which this Paul in his fields, if you will, comes into this town. We're going to see his, the way he reacted. First of all, we're going to see what he saw. Scripture is very clear. Luke says that he saw something. Secondly, that he felt something and that he did something. So that's kind of the three headings in which I will walk through the first couple verses this morning. First of all, what Paul saw. Look at verse 16. He says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens. So it almost as if if it's like he was just literally waiting for them to get there. He had no intent to go. He had no intent to to actually go into Athens and actually begin to preach the gospel. He was literally waiting, but something happened. His spirit was provoked with him when he saw the city was full of of idols. Now here he is in his waiting. He's at his lowest moment, but he's in this place called Athens, this beautiful architecture. There's, there's temples and shrines all over the place. And whenever his eyes continue to see it, that deep within him, a spirit was provoked because he saw that the city was full of idols. As I said, the city was full of beautiful buildings and architecture and monuments. There was Aropolis, which was the ancient citadel that was elevated so high that it could be seen from four miles away. It was dedicated to the national glory and the worship of God. And there's the Parthenon and there's the Agora, which is the marketplace where we see you go, where there was painted porticos all around by, by famous artists. And he could have went and could listen to debates of statesmen and philosophers. And so I want to remind you that Paul also was not an uncultured Philistine. Paul was from the greatest university in Tarsus in Jerusalem. He was a Hellenistic in the sense that he spoke Greek. He understood. Matter of fact, when we get to Mars Hill, he actually quotes their poet, poets back to them. He knew, he knew Greek poetry. He can even just quote it where there was the Holy Spirit just given to him. Or I'm thinking he's probably studied it. He wasn't just a barbarian that didn't understand culture. You follow me? Like we got to understand that about him. So here he is with Athens that is filled with landscape of beautiful architecture. Where most of us would go, man, I would love to, I would have just loved to see it and taken in that there's just the, the vibe and the culture of Athens and, and Greece. He saw not its beauty and brilliance, but Luke said he saw its idolatry. The word he uses there, full of idols, literally means to be smothered or under or swamped with idols. 
that Athens, the, the landscape was just flooded. It was swamped. It was a forest of idols is what Paul saw. Athens, as we see actually when you, next week when Luke uh, preaches, he'll actually begin in verse 22 where Paul says, Hey, I, I perceive that you guys, you're very religious. They were so religious that they wanted to make sure they were worshiping all the gods. And what we'll see is that there may have been a God they didn't know about, so they had a place set up for an unknown God just in case they missed him. Uh, they were very religious. They didn't want to miss out on any kind of worship or any kind of deity, so they were very religious people. And they want as many gods as they could. As a matter of fact, some God, one writer said that Athens was just a great altar and a great sacrifice. The whole thing was an altar. Another writer said it was easier to find a God in Athens than it was a man. There were altars and shrines all over the place. There was the Parthenon. This is one maybe we've heard of. It was made of gold. There was a gold and ivory statue to Athena whose gleaming spear, the tip of it, could be seen, they set up from 40 miles. It held images of the Apollo and Jupiter and Venus and Mercury and Bacchus and Neptune and Diana. And more, the entire Greek roster of Olympian gods were represented there. Statues made of stone, brass, gold, silver, ivory, and marble. And there was no, thing, no need to think that Paul didn't actually see them. But watch this. He was not impressed by them. He was oppressed by them. Literally, he was oppressed by this idolatrous use to which God, their God-given artistic creativity was being put to use. Literally, he, the city was submerged by idols. So when Paul gets to Athens, he was all up in his fields, and he was just waiting on Silas and Luke to get there. But the more he saw the city, the more it took in that this place was filled. It was swamped with idols. Application, just to the three words in first one. First of all, how do, how do we respond when we're in our fields? Definitely whenever the things that God's called us to. Right? Like, so we see him... Obviously, probably disappointed alone, and oftentimes we just go, all right, God, I'm done, or it's not worth it, or whatever. How do we respond? But I think what we can understand, actually, uh, it's like this. It's like some of you may know, some of you may not know. Uh, I, I paint on the side. I pastor full-time, but I paint on the side. And before I painted a lot, I didn't ever really notice issues uh, like where people painted before me, like I never noticed like places they messed up or where they actually did paint the wall paint on the crown and things like I never, I never saw it before. But now that I've painted a lot, I can't go into a room without looking at the paint. And I know when they mess up, I know whenever I, like I can tell you like, hey, they, they use this type because that's what I see. You follow me? When I go into a room, well, with Paul in his spiritual eyes, he could not go somewhere and just see it at face value. But behind the bright and shiny things, he was able to see there was something greater going on. There was such a, there was a, a, a bigger deal, if you will. And so uh, what's behind the bright and shiny things, are we able to see things for what they are? He said he saw that the city was filled with idols. And we'll talk more about idols in a minute, but an idol is that which takes the place of God. So, Justin, how can I know that I, the idols in my own life? So, we're just looking at Athens, but all, <laughs> most of us want to read this text and go, I'm Paul, but reality is we're Athens. That our, our hearts and our lives are filled with idols that oftentimes it's flooded, it's swamped. We're not the hero, we're the, the idolater. And so I ask the question, what are the idols that are in our life? We look at this text and say, man, Paul saw that, and even we have to apply that. And it says, what are the idols in my own life? So how can I locate or how can I know with, with the idols in my life? I ask this question, what is it that consumes your thoughts, your worries, and your affections? What is it that keeps you up at night? What is it that makes you lose sleep? What is it that makes you stop trusting in God and think you can take care of it on your own strength? What altars do we sacrifice to? So just to make that make sense, like what are the idols? And we, we obviously we can identify those in Athens. There's the Parthenon and there's these and that and there's these statues. But what does it look like for us today when we look upon the landscape of even just Laurel, Jones County? We find ourselves 
with an idol of politics and wealth and my job and my spouse. That ultimately, even in the church, we look out and see the city is full of idols. And say, Justin, I'm supposed to love my spouse more than anyone. Yeah, my first call outside of my relationship with the Lord is to love Ashley and serve Ashley. Let me tell you something. Ashley makes a terrible God. And I make a terrible God. Listen to me. Your kids make a terrible God. The idols that we have in our life. Because ultimately, and I wrote down here, college football, et cetera. There are things in which that we, in our city called our lives, that we have elevated. And my prayer is that God, like he did Paul, give us spiritual eyes to see, not just in the world around us, but even in my own life, my own heart. Paul was there waiting, but God opened his eyes not to see the architecture, but to see the idolatry. And oftentimes, we're blind to our own tendencies. That's why we need the word of God. And what the Psalms teaches, who can discern his ways? We need the word of God to open our eyes to see ourselves. And so I pray, I think an application is, God, please give me eyes to see even idols in my own life. Not just point at the Athens, but me. So we see what he saw. He saw that the city was full of idolatry. Secondly, we see what he felt. Not only did he see something, but he felt something. Look again at verse 16. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. So probably already, as I began talking about Athens and its idolatry and the, its systems and ways, we automatically began to think, and even in our, probably definitely in our conservatism uh, in South Mississippi, began to look at like the landscape of the United States and like there's this frustration that begins to boil up when us, thinking about them. Right, you're thinking, and so don't quite get there yet because I don't think that's what was really agitating Paul. Uh, but I'll break that down a little bit in a minute. But it said his spirit was provoked within him. Uh, this word in the Greek is literally mean it's greatly distressed. And when it's used in a medical sense, it was used in the in the in medical as in having a seizure, an epileptic fit. It's, a, it's a, to irritate or to raise to an anger that when Paul saw this, that deep within his spirit, there was an anger that began to rise up. And say, hold on, isn't this the same Paul that wrote to the Corinthians that said that love is not easily angered? Right? Was Paul here not treating the Athenians the same way he did the Corinthians? Did he just have something against the Greeks here, or is there something going on here? Or is he just plain out angry because of idolatry? The verb here, when it says he was provoked within his spirit, uh, he was greatly distressed. It's in the imperfect tense, uh, which means it was a, a continual settled reaction. As in what Luke is saying is that whenever he was there waiting, the more he saw it, the more unsettled he became. It wasn't just like this instant, like he walked in and just lost it. It was the more he saw it, the more he was inundated with it, the more his spirit was greatly distressed or provoked, if you will. It was a great distress. And I want you to remember, nobody's with Paul here. This, this, this extreme word is the word that Paul would have shared with Luke ex- describing the story of when he went to Athens, that this is the word that I use, I choose to use when I was in Athens. This great distress. And this word is used often in the Old Testament, but it's used regularly in reference to the Holy One of Israel being God. God's reaction to idolatry. Whenever there was the golden calf of Mount Sinai or the idolatry to Baal or those others, it says that what? That the Lord was provoked to anger. It's the same word that we see with Paul here. This provoking in his spirit, this unsettling in his spirit is the same word that's used for God when it comes to idolatry in the Old Testament, that it was, that it was, he was provoked. So we see in the text that Paul was provoked by idolatry just as God himself is. And here's the reason. Here's why he was provoked. It was for the name and the glory of God. Oftentimes the 
the word in the Old Testament used is jealousy. In Exodus 34, 14, it says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. We understand jealousy, and so let's define it for a moment. What is jealousy? Jealousy is a resentment of rivals. Jealousy can be good or bad depending on if the rival has business being there. Just a news flash. There's a baby girl. Here's the news flash. It's like jealousy. Let's just say I'm jealous of somebody because they could outshine me rather in, in looks, in sports, or in smarts. That jealousy is a bad jealousy because none of us own the monopoly on any of those areas. However, if there's a third party trying to enter into my marriage, I have all right to be jealous because that third party does not deserve to be in the place in that marriage. You with me? And it is the same with God. Isaiah 42, 8, God says this, I am the Lord and that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Listen to me. God has the right to exclusive allegiance. And is jealous if we transfer it to anyone or anything else. And moreover, the people of God who love God's name should share it, share in that jealousy for his name, his honor, and his glory. What we see going on in Acts, and he just wasn't mad because of their, uh, their lack of knowledge. He was frustrated. He was provoked within because God was not receiving glory that he alone was due. That his glory and honor is being placed on things that were made with hands, not on and in God. 1 Kings 19.10, Elijah said this to the people. He said, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life. He said, I am jealous for the name of the Lord because the people of Israel have forsaken him and run to other gods. 2 Corinthians, Paul tells this to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband and present you, and to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. What, what he was frustrated with, there was this jealousy as he wanted the Corinthians to worship God and give God alone the, the worthy and the glory, or the worth and the glory that he alone is due. So the pain, listen to me, I'm landing somewhere. This, so the pain that Paul felt, was not due to a bad temper or even pity. And listen here, even fear of their eternal salvation. It was due to his hatred for idolatry, which aroused a deep, strong jealousy for the name of God as he saw human beings giving honor and glory to idols instead of to the one who alone is due that honor and that glory. So application, just a couple of verses, I'm going to remind you that God does not share his glory with anyone or anything. Secondly, we see that God's glory was a motivation for Paul's mission. I've wrote down motivations of why we go on mission, why we go and share the gospel, why we go and preach the good news and some motivations are obedience to the Great Commission. God has commanded us to do this. Jesus explicitly says that go and make disciples of all nations. We do it in obedience. For some, we do it out of compassion. We think about people who don't know Jesus. We don't want them to spend eternity separated from him. But what we learn from this text is that the chief motivation is the glory of God. That Athens was full of idolatry, which means people were worshiping. They were idol worship where God was not receiving the praise and honor that is due his name among these people. And it bothered Paul deep within. The Father has given the Son supreme honor that every, at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to his lordship. Listen to me. And when he is denied that, we should fill it.
Lecrae had in one of the songs, I think he got it from John Piper, but it said, he said that worship exists, I mean, missions exist because worship doesn't. And the reality is worship does exist, it's just not worship of the one true God. We all bow down to something God is being, or little God is being worshiped, and the reason why we go is because we say that the God we serve, he alone is due all the praise, honor, and glory from every mouth, every tongue on the face of the planet. And so when we think about our culture, our context, we're not in Athens, we're in Mississippi, we're in the United States. Oftentimes, we're blinded by our own busyness of lives. So we pray, God, give me eyes to see past the bright and shiny things. And God, where you're not being worshipped, let it burn a hole in my spirit. That we're jealous for God's name. We're jealous for his honor. We're jealous for his glory. Not that we want it, but we want to make sure he alone is getting it. And primarily the way that he gets it is by, his, by believers going and preaching the gospel and people being redeemed. And that's exactly what we see Paul did. Look at verses 17 and 18. So, so he was there waiting. He was looking, and the more he looked, the more this righteous indignation raised up within him, and his response was not to bury his head in the sand. His response was not to say, well, they're going to hell in a handbasket. His response was, it's, it was not, well, it's their problem. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to worry about it. His response was not, listen to me, Jesus is coming back soon, so it's all good. But what we see is this stirring in his spirit with this holy indignation caused him to actually open his mouth and share the gospel to these people. These people who were willingly worshiping false gods, Paul didn't just go, you big dummy. He went and he shared the gospel with them. He engaged them with the gospel. He didn't just bury his head in the sand and hope it went away, but he sought to convince them to turn from these idols and to trust the Lord Jesus. Firstly, Scripture says that he followed his custom and went to the synagogue. Look in verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue. So yes, uh, not only were there all those temples and things to worship, there's also a synagogue there. So he went first of all, went to the synagogue, and it says he reasoned. It's the same word that we saw in Thessalonica where he, he spent time just answering questions, fielding questions, reasoning with them. And so you would imagine in the synagogue, he was doing what he was doing in Thessalonica in the sense of going, here's the Christ of the Old Testament. Here's the historical person of Jesus. Jesus is that Christ. But imagine that's what he did. And so he went first to the synagogue. Secondly, it says that he went to the marketplace. We see that in verse 17. And in the marketplace, check this, every day with those who just happen to be there. This is a beautiful picture of Paul. It's like we see him strategically going to the synagogue, and there he's going to stand up in front of everybody, and he's preaching, or he's, he's explaining, he's reasoning. And then it says when he would leave there every day, so he was there maybe one day a week, and then every day after that he would go to the marketplace, which is like Walmart for us or a park, and he would sit there and he would, he would, he would try to reason with people. And it says by anybody who passed by, could you imagine Paul? Like, hey, 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 hey. Hey, 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 like, here he is in his mind. He's, he's so convinced, though, as we talked last week, that Christ is the only hope for mankind. He's been sitting there in his fields. He's been waiting for, for Silas and them to get there. And he's sitting there, and he's seeing the, the depravity and the idolatry of this, of this place. And this righteous indignation stirred him so much that he went to a place where people were going to be going to anybody that passed by. He said, hey, can I share with you the gospel? We oftentimes think about Paul, and we're going to see him in a second, stand up at Mars Hill and have a conversation with the most intellectual people there are. We have this high and mighty view of Paul only preaching sermons in a synagogue and in, these, in, court all, or court, in the court or things like that. But what we see this man who was so convinced that Jesus was the only way, that he wanted to try to convince these people to turn from these idols, that he would go to the pub, most public place possible and share the gospel with anybody that was coming by. 
We don't see this super sophisticated mode of evangelism. We just see a guy who believed that Jesus was the only way and went to where the most people were going to be. And I was convicted by that this week because I fall a trap and a trap often that my place to preach the gospel is on the stage at Cross Point Church. And if I'm not preaching the gospel out there, then how dare me stand up here and preach it where it's safe. And oftentimes we're waiting for that Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin, I'm sorry, the synagogue would be equivalent to a church today. The uh, Oropagus that he'll get to in a little bit, that'd be like the university where there's studied people or maybe in a courtroom like where there's studied people. And oftentimes we think about preaching Jesus in those extremes, but what we see in the middle is common every day, people walking through that Paul is sharing the gospel with them. And that's what we're called to. And what I pray is by looking at this text this morning that you and I, that God will open our eyes to, I mean, I'm thankful for the revitalization of Laurel. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that it has brought some of you who are in this congregation here, and now you're a member of church because of what God has done at Laurel. In Laurel, I thank God for that. I thank God for the families that have been blessed financially and whatever from the thing. Listen to me, but my prayer is is that God will open our eyes around us that we'll see past the shiny and bright things and see the real need that there are people that walk even in Jones County, Mississippi who are living their idols under the bondage of idol worship. They're living their life serving other gods that is not Christ. And that would be so moved by that, that would go share. That's exactly what we see with Paul. I don't think he had any intention in going into the city. I really don't. I just think the more he saw it, he couldn't contain himself anymore. And that's my prayer for, for me and you is that as we we see not just scripture, but we see the world and see that our world is swamped with things. And I say it this way, our world is swamped with things. I want to call it idols if you don't want to call it idols. They're swamped with things that are taking the place of God. If you can't see it, then let's ask God to open our eyes. And primarily it's because we want Christ Jesus to receive Praise, honor, and glory on this side of eternity. Not to be that guy, but I am that guy, is because eventually every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. But I want people to have the opportunity on this side of eternity because they don't have an opportunity. They don't have a choice then. So second, he went to the, anyway, he went to the marketplace, and there he would begin to ask questions. It was, a, it was the reason, they, so the reason in the synagogues and in the marketplace. But thirdly, it says that he, uh, some Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. I'm only going to tell you this, because in his speech at Mars Hill, uh, is very, the things I'm about to talk about with the Epicureans and the Stoics, you see it all the way through his his, his speech, his message, or his sermon. And I wish that I had the opportunity to teach that because uh, so far we've really only studied Paul's sermons to Jews. Uh, a couple chapters ago, whenever he was in Lystra, we saw like a, just a couple verses of his sermon to Gentiles. But here in Acts 17, at Mars Hill, it's like the quintessential sermon to Gentiles. And we don't even like when he goes and spends... 18 months in Corinth and a couple years in Ephesus. We never really have records uh, of his actual sermons. And so I believe like the same way he did in synagogues, I think probably a lot of the same messages as he went through. Uh, if he was like most modern evangelists, they've got one sermon, they just preach it in different locations. Anyway. So thirdly, it says this in 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. So there's this conversation, there's still this reasoning. The Epicureans uh, they were a group of philosophers that they believed that the gods were remote or far off and they had 
no interest or influence in human affairs, that it was up to man to, to do his own thing, that the world was due to just chance and, and randomness. There was no reason, rhyme, that it just, it was here, God started it, they stepped back, and now man is up to his, his own destiny, he is, he's in charge of it. There's no afterlife, they believe, that there's no survival of death. Like once you die, it's done, and there's no judgment. And say, Justin, this is very important whenever Paul, because we're going to see how, just how smart uh, and red Luke, or Paul is when he stands before uh, them. They believe that humans should pursue pleasure and avoid pain and fear altogether. So in one sense, you have this one group of people who don't believe in so they don't believe in a resurrection. And so you'll see in a minute they had a hard time saying, he's coming in preaching about Jesus and resurrection. Life after, matter of fact, I think that uh, some even believe, because notice, uh, look at uh, yeah, verse 18. It says, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? The word babbler there literally means like a seed picker. I was used to like a bird that would go and like just pick up random seeds and, and didn't really have, be able to provide for himself. And then it became in human form. It really meant like a teacher uh, who didn't have any knowledge of his own, but he just kind of picked from here and there of, of different people's, what they taught and, and kind of try to teach it as his own. And so they're making fun of him. Like this guy isn't really smart. Uh, but then and they say this, and others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, as in he's preaching, they take it as he's preaching multiple divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Like some people believe that the Epicure, like they really were thinking that he was now presenting a God named Jesus and a God named resurrection. Uh, which is where we get our word eventually, Anastasia is the same word there, is that so they were so wanting to make sure they worship all the gods, they're even taking the resurrection as, is he preaching us two different gods here? But anyway, is it, but what we see here is that uh, the, the, the Epicureans and Stoics, sorry, Stoics, uh, they were pantheistic, and just like the Epicureans were, uh, everything was due to chance, the Stoics were fatalists, that everything was determined by fate, it was predetermined and inevitable. The, 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 the duty of man was to pursue, pursue his, his, his reason for being there in harmony with life, to develop a self-sufficiency and endure pain because it was inevitable to happen. So you have two people on total office, opposite spectrums. One says, seek pleasure, avoid pain. One says, there is no pleasure, just endure the pain. One says that gods have no, no dealings with humanity. There's no death. There's no survival of death. There's no judgment. And you'll, like I said, you'll hear echoes of this in Paul's speech next week. And eventually, uh, this is where we'll kind of, this is halfway through the text. And so we see what he saw, what he felt, what he did. And next week, we'll see what he said. Uh, so let's just kind of read. I'm going to read a couple of verses just to get Luke set up. And it said, so others said, this is verse 18, others said, uh, he seems to be a preacher uh, of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection and they took him and brought him uh, to Arapagus or Mars Hill saying we know uh, what this new teaching we want we may know may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting for you bring strange things to our ears we wish to know therefore what these things mean and it says now all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there and man it's just I think you could preach on this, but I'm not. Would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And that's where Luke could pick us up next week. The application just of that, what Paul did is that, that's what I pray for me and you, is that our passion for the Lord's honor and glory will lead us just not to talk about it amongst one another, but to share the gospel with people who don't know him. That's what the church struggles with. We spend a lot of times talking to each other about God's honor and his glory. But we don't often share it with people who don't know him at all. That God would give us spiritual eyes to see past the shine, shiny and bright things, the Athens, and see it not just as a place of beauty and architecture, but a place that is swamped with idols. And those idols are taking the place 
of the glory of Jesus, and we are to go and share so that Jesus alone receives the glory out of all people's hearts and minds. And the second thing we see in that text is that the same gospel that saves the Jews, the same gospel that saves the common person, that saves the intellectual. That we all come to faith in Jesus, but the same message, that message is the gospel. Let's pray, Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that uh, we can look to your word and we can just see uh, just this account where Paul made, maybe didn't desire to be in Athens, but God, while he was there, God, you opened his eyes to see a city for what it was, a city that was lost, that was under bondage, that was even wasting their talents and their gifts and their intellects by doing it to the worship of idols. God, in that, what he saw drove him with a deep burning passion to go share the good news the good news that would free the Jew, the good news that would free the common man, and the good news that would free the philosopher, that Christ came. To die, to set us free from the bondage of idols, from the bondage of self-sufficiency, from the bondage of fatalism or whatever you want to fill in the blank. God, we thank you for your scripture. God, I pray that we just won't be hearers of your word, but that we'll be doers of it. God, that this word that we so highly lift up to teach and to receive, God, that we will do your word, that we will go and we'll share the good news, that we'll see where you're at work, and we'll join you there. God, if there's anybody in here this morning that has not trusted in Jesus, maybe they're like the Athenians where Paul says, I perceive that you are very religious. Maybe we've been trusting in our religion. Maybe we've been trusted in checking just like the heart of the Athenians were to make sure all the God boxes were checked so sufficiently that they had an altar to an unknown God. They didn't want to miss. Maybe we've lived our life in this religious way that we're making sure we're checking off all the boxes, that we're doing all the right things, but yet we have yet to trust in Jesus. So God, may this morning we repent of our religiosity and we trust in Christ. God, maybe there, there's a believer or two in here that you have exposed idols in their life. Maybe you've exposed people or things or places that have taken your right place. And God, you reminded us this morning that you share your glory with no one. So God, if there are people, even places in my own life where I built an altar to, a, to an idol, God, I pray that you would reveal that, God, you, you would crush it. And God, I pray that for every person in here, God, if there's the idol of husband or wife or family or children or job or, or hobby or whatever it is, God, whatever that idol we've placed in our life, God, we may, we be like King Asa in Chronicles where he goes and he tears down the ashram poles and fortifies the city. May today, through the power of your spirit, may we, may we confess, repent, and allow you to break those idols that are stilling our affection and devotion for you and stilling honor and glory to you. Yeah, I pray that maybe our response is repentance. How you move, Spirit.
<clears throat> lead us, and may we submit to your leadership. It's in Christ's name. Amen. If you need to talk, I'll be standing in the back. If not, you just respond as the Lord leads.